Hi, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sails podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive, and we have a super extra special guest today, our very own cabin boy, Andrew Dice. Yeah, this is the part where everyone's disappointed that uh, I'm not Toby Schmitz. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just me. No, you are our extra special cabin boy. Thank you. In addition to that, you are an editor at Screen Rant and also a member of the Total Geek All podcast, which I've listened to a bunch now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Tons super fun. fun. Oh, great. I'm, well, I'm glad you enjoy the the outrageous geeking that goes on. Always. Can't have too yeah. much. That's pretty much our favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wild enthusiasm. Right. You're acting as if what we do isn't Yeah, that's true. It is kind geeking. of geeking out. Yeah, yeah. Right. This is a slightly more literary take on geeking out. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Or... If, 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 I've walked, uh, if I've walked at a Comic-Con past people screaming, Oh my God! Oh my God, Silver Billy! Then it is, it is officially it is officially geeky stuff. In the best way. That was me internally when I was at New York Comic Con. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's why your voice sounded familiar, actually. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was my internal voice was freaking out while I was being very poised. I hope, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so we're really excited to have you on, Andrew, and we. I just wanted to hear like a little bit about you know how you got to the place you are, like what your background is in talking about stories. Oh gosh, uh, well. I mean, I f well, I think like probably most people my age, the, the you know tender young age of uh, the you know twenty four to to thirty six age group demographic, uh -huh. movies, TV, um, you know, I that that way that was everything that was important to me outside of school was uh, watching every movie I can. I think you know mm -hmm. everyone probably has one parent, uh, if not both, that is kind of the one that sits you down and watches movies with you, like. Uh, for me, it was my mom watching um, <laughs> watching the uh, original Batman with my brother and I, and us thinking it was cool. Oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, us, her, us thinking it was cool of her to be such a neat mom, and then I got older and realized that she was just watching it because she liked it. Uh, <laughs> That's me. Then, um, I'm I'm yeah, that yeah. mom <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> with exactly the original Batman. <laughs> nice, yes, awesome. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, um, from that point on, it was. Uh, I don't know if it was just you kind of get into the habit of finding more intelligent ways to explain why you love something. Mm -hmm. uh, might be where it starts, or, yeah. or, or or seeing different movies and TV shows, and then taking that extra step of wondering why you like mm -hmm. some more than others. And then you start seeing what things have in common. And then you start realizing that it's kind of comes down to the story. If the story's uh -huh. really good. Mm. Everything else just kind of falls into place. Uh, mm. But then it, you know, ended up following that through high school, got really into that. It, it turned out that was the thing that I was best at and then followed that right through university. And uh, I was going to probably wind up teaching um, going through and getting a, a master's or PhD, you know, all things willing, um, but ended up uh, blogging uh, with with Screen Rant and Game Rant, which was the mm -hmm. video game side of it beforehand. And then and then uh, I realized that you know I'm going to give this whole writing on the internet thing a shot and see how that goes. And I haven't really looked back. And thankfully, it all came together that at the time I was starting out with that. Uh, all of these years I spent in my youth reading comic books wound up uh -huh. being work experience. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, that worked out real well for you. I need to find that gig for period dramas and then oh. I will have made it. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, I was also, let's just be clear, movie and TVs includes the, you know, 10 hour A&E Pride and Prejudice that I watch with my mom too. So. Excellent. I'm Good an equal man. opportunist Good there. man. We knew Andrew, like I love you. your mom. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> cheers yeah. to moms, indeed. Yes, cheers yeah, to moms. seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, here in Canada, I love two things. I love uh, hockey, and I love walking around shouting, "Oh, Mister Bennett!" <laughs> <laughs> Just for the reactions of that, yes. So, Just to see. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> yeah, we need you to do that more often. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, yeah, and which which is crazy because then um, you know I mean that that is also uh, I think that kind of 
became a product. I don't, I'm not particular, like I'm a history buff. That was the other yeah, thing. Mm-hmm. I went through English and then um, I minored in classics. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of all of that stuff and I love people taking that stuff and twisting it around and making mm-hmm. something new. And uh, I think when you say a period drama, it's funny because I feel like today that has come to also mean a better written than average drama. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I guess sort of it does. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, uh-huh. I mean, it doesn't so, always have to be, but always, it often ends up being. Often. It doesn't have to be. No, I, the, no, it's the true. Keira Knightley Pride and Prejudice uh, does not stand up to the original, in my opinion. But Well, what does? Exactly. And, you know, I, I love the, uh, let's just say that, you know, centuries ago, those people really knew how to turn a phrase. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. So maybe that is so. part of the fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me with this kind of stuff. And um, I'll be honest, my love affair with pirates took a new level, uh, actually, which is kind of what attracted me to uh, Black Sails to begin with, was uh, the video game Assassin's Creed Black uh, Black Flag. I keep hearing about... I know, everyone talks to us about this. Neither (laughs) of us are really video game people, and everyone keeps bringing this up to us. I think that's one I do want to play, though. I, right. I, I mean, I have played video games in the past. It's just not something that I go to for, right. you know, entertainment. Yeah, I yeah. have. But that one seems to be the right one. If there was going right. to be one that was going to grab me, that's going to be it. it and yeah, I, yeah. I did. I played the Harry Potter games, you know, back when, whenever. That was what? I don't, gosh, 04 probably when I played Harry Potter all the way through. But yeah, it might be time to give this another go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think I think maybe we have to, and it is it's the historical pirates. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, I think actually what they do on YouTube now is you can probably search uh, Assassin's Creed Black Flag the movie, um, and people just take out all of the cutscenes <gasps> and kind mm-hmm. of stitch them together. Oh, that's neat. Um, but that was I sent I sent you the link to the to sea all the shanties. sea shanties, and it was amazing. I was oh, at work gosh. where I have to listen to really bad Christian radio all day, and instead I was like blaring these sea shanties on my phone and just dancing <laughs> behind the coffee bar. <laughs> Not even ashamed. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. No, I actually, <laughs> if uh, you will, <laughs> I, I commented. Uh, I, I mentioned that on Twitter those sea shanties, and someone who had a friend who worked at the studio recording that said that that was a decision to amplify the uh, drunkenness of the guys singing it. They didn't want it to be too clean. Oh, and that's, yeah. And that was, that tied me into the whole, uh, you know, it, it was a, it, the video game that I was kind of always wanting to play. And then it was, uh, you know, all the same characters. You walk into a fictional version of the Caribbean and there's Anne Bonny and Jack oh, Rackham man. and Charles oh, Bane so and fun. Benjamin Horrigal. It's Rogers. Like, they were all the same characters. I've so. got to do that. Yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah. So then um, I, I, I can't remember. Someone mentioned Black Sails, and it had stuck in my memory, and I thought, you know what? Any pirate show is probably worth checking out. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, you've mentioned it before. I mean, Toby Stevens. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I was, you know, every minute that went into the show, it was another minute I was amazed I'd never seen him before. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, absolutely. Wow. And then – Found the podcast and then I was hooked. Wow. So did you like it right away from the pilot or did it take you some warming up? I think, I think Daphne, I mentioned this to you. I was, um, I was excited. I was interested in the first episode purely on Toby Stevens, really, because I was just in for that. Silver, I did not like to start. Sure. uh, Sure. Mainly because he reminds me of a character that's like a bad Firefly-esque character oh of course sure yeah i see exactly what you're saying there there is and there's one shot in that pilot right at the beginning where the guy pulls the sword and he gives a (gasps) and the camera cuts away and it is the most firefly moment because it's the most kind of saturday morning uh you know lower budget adventure uh jack of all (laughs) trades you know like those kind Uh of shows um (laughs) and i was and i thought okay i can deal with this and when he when he memorized the note i thought okay that's smarter uh-huh, than right. I would typically expect. But then when they're sitting across that table and he says, you know, what's to keep what's to keep me from killing you when, when we get there? And he said, we might be friends by then. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. That was the moment where the hook set, uh, yep. you know, that was it. I, I'm done. If if a character has the forethought and the, the writers have put this in here to say who knows where we're going to go. Yeah. Um, right. I was completely in. You're in. Yeah. yeah. Also, you know, 
let me tell you a story. Um, yes, about a Spaniard named Vasquez. Damn, yeah, all that yeah. is so good. <laughs> Cannot look yeah. away. Yeah. There was there was no getting out of that point. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious. I feel like we know a lot of people who have a soft spot for a story about a story. Yeah. And I'm just curious, like this, yeah, this show pretty much does say pretty early on, like, hey, if you're into that thing, mm -hmm. stories about storytellers. Yes. Here you go. Let us let us yeah. be upfront about what we're going to be. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm just curious, like, I feel like I know a lot of people are really into that. I'm just curious, like, how much of the, like, general public gets excited about that for me that is also like the minute the minute a character says let me tell you about storytelling and storytelling is going to be important in right. this story I don't really care like I will I mean this this yeah. show is so many more things than that too mm -hmm. but but for me that is always a thing where I'm like okay you've you've got my attention right I want to yeah. know where this is going oh and, and the the frame stories you know I I Yes. I love a good frame story. So do um, I. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Some people yeah. really, you know, don't don't like that and think it's kitschy, but I am a big fan. I always have been. I think a lot of people like TV or like movies because it is a passive experience. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do love it when, uh, you know, a TV show will kind of give you a twist and call out the fact that you are engaging in a story. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is that is. Um, I mean, this happens so many times in this show where, uh, like we said, you know, the, the Shakespearean chorus or the fool who right. so many of these scenes in this show, the character could stop and look into the lens of the camera and give the monologue, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And, and I, I think yeah, a lot of people might... soliloquies. I like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and those are for an audience, you know? Yeah. I, 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 yes. that, that, yeah you know, I... I and above all else, um, it kind of relies on what I think you both talked about is we trust the audience is smart enough to get this. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do to... appreciate that so much. Well, and the thing that's amazing to me is that there's a level of complexity for a different audience members. This is what's fascinating to me about the show is that you can just go and be like, Vane is a badass and that's awesome. And I love it when he like slashes people up. So there's that there's that way to watch the show, which is a great way to watch the show. And then there there's so many layers of it that mm -hmm. if you are into Shakespeare, you've got right. that whole thing. If you are into politics and intrigue, there sure. is that whole thing. And somehow it manages to all be interwoven without any of it feeling like, hey, we're handing you this thing. Like we're, you know, let's let's be all about philosophy. Like it's all mm -hmm. so sure. interwoven yeah. to story and the action as well. Like every single aspect of it, anything that would appeal to a different type of audience member is all embedded in the actual storytelling. Right. Yeah, we had talked about that a little bit about how the action is never just in service of the bombast. It's in service of the plot and of the story, which we really like. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. I'm, that is the, the really, really big, big thing for me. Uh, especially, you know, covering blockbusters. Oh yeah, sure. As, as much as we do is it, it really does feel like there are directors who, um, use action as entertainment or as a storytelling device. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is a very easy thing to spot when, <laughs> when yes. it's one or the other, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of watching something and the fight breaks out and you think, yeah, you know, let's go. I'm not, I, I didn't come for this. This isn't right. what you're advertising here. Uh, so, you know, this isn't really necessary, but it's funny too, because I have to think back to the first season of the show even like the idea of a sex scene breaking out in the third season is just absurd. Right. <laughs> right. Right. By the time right. we actually get there. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Or, uh, or, you know, really reveling in the violence. And I think you mm -hmm. spoke about that in the interviews before that, uh, it's not, it's never gratuitous. It's not gory. Right. No. Um, and yeah, that every harm or every injury means something to the Absolutely. Plot. Well, and even when it is a little bit gory, that is for the emotional impact of that, you know, like when in season one, when Dufresne chews that guy's neck, like I felt <laughs> like that was very, 
No, but that was very much like that wasn't like, hey, we're really into like people biting other people's necks. It's about it was really about having the audience have an emotional experience right. about identifying with the plight of of a person like that who was mm-hmm. not a fighter and had to fight. And and just the visceral experience of taking a ship and how that wasn't, you know, it it, it did almost the opposite of what a lot of violence does, I think. Right. Like it, it kind of took the sexiness out, actually. It did. Yeah. Right. It's it's like a lot of times graphic violence distances you yes. from from what's actually happening. And this was a moment where the point of of the scene was to not distance you needed to be in there because you needed Mm -hmm. to you needed to understand the transformation that Dufresne went through he had to go from like accountant guy who hung out with pirates to to like someone who had been had you know a traumatic experience like I mean I think that's part of Dufresne's arc is that he had this trauma of doing this thing and and like Uh, for him the stakes changed a lot after that mm -hmm. yeah that that's interesting to me because I can up until that point I liked him. Right. Exactly. You know? And I, I feel like I don't know how much of that is because <laughs> he just becomes really hateable. Oh uh, yes. He too. does, yes. He does. And and I feel like if if that hadn't happened, if if it hadn't been so extreme and been um because you know him him finding that side of himself is not mm-hmm. inherently good or bad i mean like we're introduced to billy murdering somebody right um, absolutely yeah and it, you know it doesn't tarnish uh our perception of their morality or ethics yeah. in this um, A sweet cinnamon roll yeah <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I don't know if you saw that on oh, yes, I did. few days. <laughs> Made me really happy. Yeah, uh. yeah uh, a cinnamon roll he is, but a uh, you know what? And that and that is kind of I feel like that almost has to be a plan shift. That Dufresne to that point was not one of the he was us, you know, more than anyone. Right, saying, exactly. I, shouldn't, I may, I'm, I'm not good at fighting, but I'm I'm really good at this. And let me give you a really good case why I shouldn't be on sure. the front line. And then that happens, and it is so unexpected and so beyond what any of us want. Right. Um, from that point on, it was it was kind of like we were drawn into Dufresne, and there are these other characters in the show earlier on that we can see ourselves in. And then things like that happen that, at least speaking for myself, I felt pushed away by that. Mm. Mm-hmm. After which you know, the things he did, I didn't feel personally, but I did not come to his defense. It was clear to me that he's not one of my guys in this group. Right, right, right. Um, And that would have been, you know, I don't know if that would have necessarily been a less effective story, but uh, he certainly quickly becomes a character that he, he, I guess he has, is of the same opinion of Gates in the way that he's looking at this, but Mm -hmm. he is no Gates. No, right. he's no Gates. No, but I, I, what I do like about that, I mean, we don't have to talk too much about Dufresne. You both know how I feel about him. <laughs> um, no, but what what is interesting in the choice that they made about the brutality of the way he ends up fighting in that fight mm-hmm. is that I, I've always believed that that's part of why he feels a, a, like everyone loves Billy. Obviously, the whole crew loves Billy. But I feel like Dufresne felt believed that he had a special connection with Billy because of the way Billy encouraged him because of Billy's role in this kind of transformation that Dufresne went through. He had this, I think, mistaken idea that he and Billy had this really special relationship and he had this special connection with Billy. And I think that that ended up somewhat motivating him. Mm. Part of his lack of practicality in his Mm. relationship with Flint had to do with this special relationship that he felt he had with billy well yeah and that's and flint as he says to silver you know men new to power think it has no limits right yes, uh, yes. and that so Dufresne true. is kind of a really great case of that he sure um, is that's so yeah. true yes he's definitely no silver mm-hmm. yeah. on many levels so i'm you know no i <laughs> <laughs> how dare you suggest such a yeah, thing so... Dummy. <laughs> I know. I can't believe we just talked so much about Dufresne. We must change topic. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm banging my foot 
to move things on here. <laughs> I know, Andrew. Did you uh, did you did you so enjoy all the discussion we had of that? That was so oh, cool. I did. First of all, so everyone knows, like all of our questions about the foot stamping came originally from Andrew. Thank you, Cabin Boy. You are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Not a connection I had made, and and it, we ended up asking everyone about it, which was just so much yeah. fun that we ended up having all of these conversations about the foot stomping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, well, the first time to be liked, and the second time to be feared, right? Yeah, which um, is amazing. There are a lot of those things, and it's you know, as as everyone kind of said when you asked it, the happy accidents that kind of happen when you are playing in this, you know, the sandbox of these shared right. things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that, that that happens a lot. I have many more theories about John Silver. I think everyone has. Do you want to do you want to share one of your theories with us? Oh, gosh. OK, well, have you considered the idea that he is Solomon Little? Yes. Oh, okay. of I course. have considered that. That hadn't really occurred to me, but it sure makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Strap in, Liz, because okay. if there is a better encapsulation, uh, I don't know of it, of Silver's inherent knack for wisdom uh -huh. and his oh, inherent sure. belief that he is not fit to be leading anybody. Oh, even then Solomon uh -huh. Little, um, uh. which, which sent me off on this, this yeah. big long line because we keep seeing him. And I think where there's even a uh, Jack makes a mention of, of Solomon is splitting a baby. Doesn't he? I, he makes an offhand yes, comment about it. Uh -huh. um, there so, is a splitting a baby. Is that Jack? I, I think it was Jack. Uh, I think he, he – it's it's delivered well enough for me not to get creeped out by that story. But, right, uh -huh. right, right, right. It, it tied into this whole thing about – because he is wise. I think that is the biggest compliment that I can pay to, to John Silver. And, and the good thing is we're all supposed to get that because we see every step of that as he you know voices it aloud. Yeah. That – uh, wisdom comes from making connections, and mm -hmm. no one is better at making connections and seeing things playing out than him. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the time we got to the third season, I actually went back to the start and started rewatching it with my girlfriend, and then got my parents onto it too. Mm -hmm. um, just calling back uh, because I I don't know that you said this explicitly, but when uh, when Pastor Lambrick, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much I want to talk mm -hmm. about him either. No, no, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, make it brief, yeah. but bring him up. Um, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, when he comes to Miranda the first time and she reads the sermon and says he has written the words that suffering is the truest form of love, mm -hmm. which was rattling around in my brain because the person who wrote that in the book was a person who wrote so much suffering into this into story, black sales, of course. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, but in that moment, he voices the opinion of Flint, which is the absolute embodiment of a love and affection for somebody is taking all of the sacrifices upon yourself. Son of a carpenter. Mm -hmm. We're going in that mm -hmm. arena. Right. And Miranda sits there and says, do you really think that? Because here's the alternative. And it's the song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. <laughs> which is not this you know, biblical idea of submission, right. which is, which is really what the suffering is. But she says it is the opposite, which is the dominance. I will go up the tree. You know, uh, I'm, this is the expression of my uh, life, really, that I'm doing something my, with my life is seeing these things I want and going to get them. Hmm. It's placed opposite the idea that none of this is for me. Uh, and I don't know how true either of those stances end up being as the story plays out because there's mm -hmm. so many contradictions inherent in that. But mm -hmm. uh, when I allow myself to think of Flint and Silver, you know, standing at that little tea time, uh, I know whose side they're on, mm -hmm. uh, which is the only time I ever want to picture Flint on the side of Pastor Lambrick ever, <laughs> um, <laughs> ever, ever, ever. Uh, but I also... I don't know how I feel about those people because one of those, uh, at least in the morality of the show, I would think that the, the show is on the side of the suffering. I mean, that is why Flint is great, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's saying, I will become this 
for everyone else. And I think that there was a time where he said, you know, I want a life beyond this, but we're well beyond that now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that he, he doesn't say it and we can get into talking about where this season ends, but I don't actually know if Flint thinks he will live through this. Right. Oh yeah. No, surely. Which, which makes that conversation with silver at the fire so much more interesting. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, Flint is probably, I think in his heart, uh, at least when he was in that cage, he knew that his road was ending and right. in front of him. Right. right. But right. the suggestion that someone would end it that wasn't him right. was, was something that he had to laugh at almost. Mm-hmm. Right. Right, right. Absolutely. And that is, I mean, the guy is in denial about a lot of things, but uh, I, I, <laughs> it makes him such an interesting <laughs> hero to get to the end of the story where everybody around him knows the day we win, you're probably not there to see it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But he won't see that. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and especially where we leave the season hang up, he's going to sail back into Nassau and um, realize that his part of the story may have been written out already. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how he'll react to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. We watch that happening. We watch him get written out of the story. Mm-hmm. And you made that comment about, you know, when he said a good man was going to have to stand up. I had thought he had come to the realization that Flint is me. I am Flint. You know, all of this is together when he when he said, you know, they followed me when they thought I was alive. Right. Right. Um, but I feel like it is kind of those moments where every step he takes, he takes a step back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because for all his gifts he doesn't share power well no. when it isn't <laughs> no. him calling the shots no which is, uh, wait, i mean and that's such a fascinating thing he he at one point in his life was very good at that mm-hmm. right uh, when we're introduced to him he's the people person right he right he's manipulated or or you know maneuvered his way up from uh kind of a lower class into being the person put forward as the most ambitious almost too ambitious to fix a colony. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. And he's happy to take a subordinate role to, to Thomas. I mean, he was happy to be basically in service of Thomas's dream. Right. When he believes in the vision. Right. I still believe that even now, some part of him has convinced himself that he is furthering Thomas's dream that has like kind of mangled Thomas's dream to the point where he thinks that war against civilization is actually is actually further. I mean, I just, I really do yeah. believe this. I think that some part of him really thinks that he's still doing the work of James McGraw, even though yeah. he's turned his back on James McGraw. I do feel like there's some part of him that still has convinced himself of that. Yeah. I mean, he had at that point, that was pre his seeing England as gnarled and gray. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. At that point, he still thought that uh, civilization was, well, he was at least denying the shortcomings of it. Like he, right, he was right. still, well, you know, right? He understood a little bit because he wanted for himself and Thomas and Miranda to go to Nassau because that was a way to escape from London. So he still, uh-huh. I think he still wanted to be within it, but like in a pocket that was a safer place for them than kind of the center mm-hmm. of it. So I think even back then he understood that there were problems in civilization yeah. that were dangerous. I mean, even before that, I mean, even when Miranda, you know, is inviting him to go hang out with her alone before this all starts. He's, he's, mm. he's always been very aware of the dangers of, you know, gossip and propriety and shame and all of that. But I do, yeah, he made a shift where he was like, okay, we can kind of exist within civilization and try to reform it from within. And that's, and then he made the shift to like, yeah, fuck that. I yeah. mm-hmm. Reform from within, no longer an option. Right. Yeah. And I, and I, I feel like, uh, it has to be implied in that, that he feels like Thomas. Well, I don't see that's the problem is, is it's kind of an all or nothing. I think in my mind, either he has accepted that he can't be what Thomas wanted him to be, or he still thinks, like you said, in his mind that Thomas would still be on his side. And I don't know how he would reason that with him because Thomas, right. mm-hmm. I mean, Like Peter Ash says that Thomas freely gave forgiveness for what had happened. Right. Those are just 
Peter's words, but it is probably true, actually. It seems <laughs> likely, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does I mean, seem likely. Yeah. Like, the, the he was threatened, too. And I think that um, cowardice is something that Thomas would forgive and Flint would kill over. Right. Yeah. Sure. No, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And so it is it is so interesting to me. I, and really I I wish there were more interactions between the characters in the story who are, you know, all queer and existing mm-hmm. outside of the fringes because, mm-hmm. you know, beyond choice. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. is is spoken but we never get Flint almost keeps that assumption off of him like water off a duck's back, you know? I yep. yeah. no choice yeah. is everything here. The only person right. I ever showed resolution to was Miranda, really. Right. Uh, that, you know, I, I cannot ask for forgiveness, and I get that. But, uh, yeah, by here, this is something completely different. I, I think that, um, you know, you I think you mentioned at the time when you say – it was so early on back then. Uh, when you, <laughs> you know, when you say that this war will stop when I get something impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. You saw it then. He's He's, you know – He's ended his life. It's just going to take a long time for it to, you know, for his heart to stop beating. Right. Um, oh, that's and, so true. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> it is, I mean, and that's that, that moment over Miranda's shoulder where his face just went from McGraw to Flint. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, when they first heard that the most unthinkable things had been done to him for reasons that he couldn't help. Uh, right. it, it was done then. Uh, but I, but I, we jump forward to now and I don't know, honestly, if when he's making that pitch to the queen, if he believes that, because none of this is possible. I mean, mm-hmm. I know that we all like to, to right. think it is. And, and no, no, it's the, very, it's exhilarating, but not possible. Exactly. And, and foolhardy and kind of shocking to me that people don't see that it is revenge. You know, it right. is mm, right, right. the desperation of a dying thing. You know, I'll take yep. as many of you down with me. And um, if that's hundreds, if that's thousands, if it's for a good reason, I'm OK with doing that, mm-hmm. uh, which is I, I'm, I'm often remember. I remember the line that, um, oh, geez, the name escapes me. It was a it was an English lord who everyone knows who said that uh, historically great men are almost never good men. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yes, uh-huh. and w- this is kind of a practice in that because yeah. uh, I honestly think that at this point in the story, and I think it's it's what the creator of the show has said: the best person here is probably Woods Rogers. Yeah, um, yeah. Who who doesn't want to fight? And I I don't want to take right. this island by force. And while that may be a timetable, he also said, you know, someone who thinks a war is so easily won. Um, well, John also said when I said the best man is is Thomas, he said, but he didn't live very long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's also yeah. very true. Thanks yeah. for that. And I mean, everyone in this who has kind of Woods Rogers has handed the reins to. <laughs> I was going to say to the psychopath beside him, <laughs> but that may be <laughs> my my, uh, my personal belief there, or or has given someone to the wrathful person beside him um, because he right. has so much to lose. Wait, who did you just who oh, did you just call Eleanor. a psychopath? <laughs> oh, really? Oh, goodness! I, I've watched those words. last episodes a, a few times. Um, well, I say you know because there's a pers- there's a difference between being vengeful and uh, lying to yourself where you think that's not why you're doing what you're doing. Right, right, uh, right, right. Mm-hmm. right. But, but yeah, I mean, in, in this world, everyone's out to get something, and as soon as you get it, uh, that's when you have something to lose, and things get very strange. I think that. Exactly. You know, um, but that being said, that also opens up the door to uh, martyrdom in the you know second to last episode. Uh, yeah. Charles wanted a future he could measure in months that were a lot of fun and filled with things mm. and yeah. women and alcohol and sex and maybe some fun violence in there anyway. Um, but in the end, he had nothing to lose and, you know, set incredible things in motion. Um, yeah. I don't think you can really do that. Your, your commitment is your burden, right? We keep going back to that. Right, 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 right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's funny because 
I feel like you can face off a lot of these characters uh, against each other and see how many of them would have been the same, uh, you know, but for a few decisions. If at any point in his life John Silver had decided that I want to be famous, he just is Jack. Right. You know. Um, huh. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. And if, Oh, that's interesting. I, I You know, or, or the, I, I picture that. I think that's. Right, mm-hmm. sure. Case because he has all the same skills, and honestly, if Jack didn't really care about his name, if his father had lived, um, and he, you know, didn't want to be a tailor, then he just is John Silver. Um, yeah. At the same time, uh, <laughs> there is definitely a path before me in which James McGraw becomes Woods Rogers. Oh yeah, um, that would absolutely. I mean, Woods Rogers set that basically yeah. set that out. I mean, and that is interesting because because James McGraw. I, you know, I made the point very strongly because in the beginning of season three, Liz had compared Woods Rogers to Thomas. And I was like, no, we're going to see in a few episodes how (laughs) much he's not Thomas. But Mm -hmm. no, but that, but the James, I mean, again, Woods Rogers makes that parallel himself. But that is a good parallel because, because Mm -hmm. James McGraw was a person who had been, had been inspired by by noble thoughts, but was basically a very practical person. And I think that is, that fits with Woods Rogers as well. Like he is no Thomas, obviously, because Thomas yeah. existed in the world of ideals. But they would but have been a great James... pair. Right. They would have been, they would have been <laughs> strange partners. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny too, because I guess Flint, I mean, what he said at that table where Thomas is obviously the idealist, um, mm-hmm. But you know, not not a foolish one, no, just no, an idealistic no. one. No, he just um, his prior well, his priority was on the ideal, as opposed mm-hmm. to on the practicality. Whereas exactly. James McGraw mm-hmm. had also the capacity for the idealism, but but right. the but his focus was on the practicality. Right, and that's mm-hmm. uh, we can maybe talk about how much his mind was clouded. Because it was <laughs> by affection. Uh, yes, I think um, I think we sure. call, I think we called him intoxicated. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, yes, I think we uh-huh. did. I think actually, I think Miranda called it intoxication. <laughs> that we just took that from her. Yeah, uh, that you know, he said that I find his his motives just, and I find his mm-hmm. argument persuasive. Which right. that that struck me as even. Even with how he felt and where his loyalties lied, I think he is right. I think that was a persuasive argument. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, so it, it, it's a real shame because we've been introduced to three tacticians in Thomas Woods Rogers and Flint who probably could have done this. Yes, right. Yeah, um, the three of them you know, together. <laughs> back when James was the baby-faced uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> young sailor and Woods was. Aww. Uh, Dimples you know, McGraw. Yeah. <laughs> McGraw. That's what I was thinking back when we was Dimples McGraw. Oh yeah, I thought the same thing. Yeah, that he, you know, and and there's also something to be said, and maybe it's a maybe it's a crutch that writers just love to fall on because it's so much fun to do it. Um, but when he said to Thomas, you know, people who want to change the world, they, they don't because of everyone else. And, yes. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. that's, you know, I don't know if that's a crutch. I mean, that's, that's, it's true. That's hey. a very realistic statement. That's a yeah. serious, yeah. Mm-hmm. serious issue in, but in, in the story that, world and in the real world. Yeah. And, and that lesson along with all of his abilities to measure a situation and see things coming before they got there, they mm-hmm. left Flint. That is not a skill that Flint has. Um, yeah. you know, when, when, when John went up on the deck and said, you know, you, you, you look unconcerned, uh, you know, what, what do you, th- I'm just trying to look unconcerned. Right. He wasn't thinking, he wasn't calculating in the same way. He eventually just said, you know, you figured this out. Like you do it. Yeah. I know what needs to happen, but because of the things that I've committed myself to, I no longer have the tools to do it. Hmm. Which mm-hmm. is also, I think, saying something interesting about, the cost of leadership. Yeah. Uh, and, and you've, you know, you guys have talked about that a lot with uh, Eleanor when she was in the thick of it. Um, she was swayed by Flint. She was swayed by her emotions. Um, and now that she has, the crown isn't hers. 
Exactly. Um, right. But at the same time, I feel like Max in that position would be a whole lot more effective. Well, mm-hmm. okay. There, there are, I mean, again, <laughs> I'll argue, as you know, mm-hmm. love Max a whole lot. Oh, yes. Uh, I think that Max is a match for any of them. If not, if not smarter than all of them put together. I mean, I love Silver, and I love Silver when he's being smart, which is pretty much all the time. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think he, I don't think, I don't think <laughs> toe to toe. I'm not sure he could go up against Max. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> you know what? And you, you broached that subject of of his potential wife. Uh, if they mm-hmm. pull off that bait and switch oh, and right. that show begins with him rushing onto that island and running smack into max yeah mm-hmm. oh my gosh that'll just be the ultimate book ending um mm-hmm. but yes, but uh-huh. at the same time and i would really like to get your your thoughts on this i mean you said you love silver because you, what silver is hot because he recognizes how brilliant Maddie is. <laughs> that's that's Liz. Oh, that's uh-huh. Liz. Yes. yes. <laughs> I will you know what? I will join you in the hotness claims by saying that at the end of the day, I don't think anyone's hotter than Miss Mapleton because she <laughs> sees that Max is sticking around. <laughs> She's, you oh know, my god. Something okay, like that. wait, 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 she... wait, wait, Andrew. We we yeah. now have you on the record calling Mapleton hot. <laughs> <laughs> she is a classy and lovely exactly. lady. And you okay. know what? Maybe, well, no, maybe no, no. Classy is no, not no, 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 no. Classic. I do not hate Mapleton, actually. She is a smart... You said cookie. classic, not classy. She's a snake yeah, in the she grass. she is a snake in the grass. <laughs> I first said classy, then I changed it to okay. classic. Classic. Yes. Yeah. She, is, she is the character in the Dickens novel who nobody yes. likes, but she's lived through some stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. Exactly. absolutely. Sure. She is a survivor and she is savvy. Yeah. She's, she's no right. Max. She's been impressing me lately. Yes. Because she was just kind of, um, she was pretty one-dimensional here when we first <laughs> met her, of course, mm-hmm. and, and we were engineered to dislike her, right. or it was engineered right. that we should dislike her. But as we're getting to see the way in which she mm. is smart, it's, I don't know if I find myself, I wouldn't even call it sympathizing with her, but just I have a respect mm-hmm. for Mapleton. She's really intriguing do. in the end of season three, like her yeah. speech about Eleanor yeah. and then oh, yes. her, then her, yes. you know, like basically all of her conversations with Max definitely put her in a place mm-hmm. where she's, but she was intriguing throughout. I mean, think about it. She was the madam. So like, you know, we know this is sure. not nothing. And then when we right. find out that in fact, she was still getting information um, from from the prostitute who happens to be Tom Hopper's wife, Laura, Laura Hopper. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that little detail. So we see, we have little bits and pieces of Mapleton showing that she is a formidable person freely from, from the beginning. I love that they made right. the choice to give her a larger role in the end of season three. And I really hope we get a lot more of her in season four because she is intriguing. I don't, like her. Yes. I definitely don't think she's classy, <laughs> but she is intriguing. I, I will grant you that. And the speech with Eleanor I thought yeah. was fascinating because I love the idea mm. that that this is a world where, like all frontier stories, like Firefly, like Deadwood, mm-hmm. like all of our beloved frontier stories, people survive and thrive based on their own capabilities. Mm. And this is a frontier story. I mean, it's not a Western, but it is a frontier story because we are living outside of civilization, specifically. Um, These are outcasts Mm -hmm. who have, you know, people didn't choose all of our main characters. They didn't really choose this for the fun of it. Right. They all ended up there because they are. Their other options were exhausted. Exactly. That's the perfect way to (laughs) say it. Their other (laughs) options were exhausted. And so so all Mm -hmm. of them to a lesser or greater degree are working based on their wits and whatever 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 status mm-hmm. they've gained is based on their capabilities. Mm-hmm. So we know already that Mapleton had that because she was where she was. Yes. But I find the moment where she understands Eleanor to be fascinating because she's someone who had power to some extent, but isn't a main player. But she's savvy, and she understands people. Well, she doesn't people. want to climb, right? She has, she has no ambition to climb. Well, she might. She might have ambition to climb. What I love about her position is that she's someone who's savvy, 
who got to watch all of the main players play their games. And that's why she's the yeah, perfect sure. person to have insight about Eleanor. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's not they, personally they... invested like Max or Vane, who both have told us stuff about Eleanor. She's someone who's just who's actually just watched Eleanor. Mm -hmm. For, yeah, and the, the the reason I say she doesn't want to climb is the you know conniving, greedy person takes the information mm -hmm. she has to Eleanor. Oh, sure. Well, right. except except. That Eleanor is not being so smart, so maybe the that, smart that person takes thing. it to Max. That is, yeah, and I mean, you know, sometimes the smartest thing you can do is hit your wagon, uh, you know, to, to the right horse. Uh, yeah, but yes, Max yeah. would be my horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I did. I did want to get your thoughts because I had initially sent an email about uh, how how so many of these characters are kind of. Uh, denying something important get got them to this point in their story mm -hmm. and then uh recognizing and accepting what they've been denying makes them a power player or gives them new doors but right. it also sure. you know it can let them take some tumbles uh mm -hmm. some of them into mm -hmm. the gallows <laughs> right but max i feel like is she's almost the antithesis to that because you know, we get the reveal of, of, of her upbringing, uh, and like you said, yeah. everything locks into place for her. Um, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. this is her childhood trauma that she will now not stop pursuing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if that has made her stronger or weaker or more or less mm -hmm. vulnerable. And right. whether her turn is might be, you know, one of the ones that is held off until season four, where mm -hmm. it, it almost, when we were introduced to her, she just wanted to run away because she was in love. Right, right, what's, right. Mm -hmm. what's implied there is, is so interesting to me because it equates slipping back into how childhood trauma defined you mm -hmm. was a mm -hmm. maturation for her. Hmm. You know, in, in oh, that she kind of cast off this childish, which right. probably... Would have been a happier story <laughs> if her and Eleanor just ran off and were oh, together. Oh, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a very different and not at all black sail story. Yes, yes, and, <laughs> and instead, you know, she said this yes. thing that is eating away inside of me about me not being good enough to be on the inside. Mm -hmm. That is what I need to follow. You know, it's the antithesis of Flint. Flint was born when he stopped denying. Right when he stopped. Right. Uh, when he right. just accepted that this is beyond choice, mm -hmm. it was an empowering thing. And Max's feels like mm -hmm. it isn't, mm -hmm. at least to me. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. really interesting. I mean, it, yeah, you know that I've been focusing a lot on this whole concept of like people. I mean, I do I do think it's the end of season three. There is this interesting juxtaposition of like possibly Jack, at least momentarily, has given up on the thing he has always been fixated on, whereas Max is still in it. And for Jack, I think that's actually, I mean, again, he's part of this big rebellion against England. So we know, we know, we know the history to some extent, at least we know that's not going to work out well for anyone, but at least in the moment, I feel like Jack is actually in, in a better place than he's been in a long time. So I do believe that for the characters, it's probably empowering for them to let go of the mm. thing that is beyond choice to some extent. It's, it's so hard to predict what's going to happen with Max. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I have a lot of kind of yes. personal feelings about th the philosophy of the show as a whole, which again, I can't pinpoint, I can't mm -hmm. pinpoint the philosophy of the show as a whole, as much as I would like to until I've seen the whole thing. Right. Of course. I feel like for Max, the outcome that would be the most positive for her is for her to let go is for her to, to, to let go of that thing. Because I feel like characters, again, Flint aside, because he is kind of a special case, but I feel like when characters mm -hmm. let go of the thing that has been driving them, the, the, the trauma that brought them right. to this outcast status. So, the, so they, they, they get to Nassau because they're outcasts, because something didn't fit mm -hmm. with civilization, something, something civilization rejected them all to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so they end mm -hmm. up in this world, in this frontier world, where they can remake themselves, and they're all very good at that, obviously. But because they're all propelled 
by whatever trauma got them there to begin with. Suffering. They, right. Some sort of suffering mm -hmm. that that they're trying that they they all seem through the backstories we find out that all of them seem to be to some extent trying to make whole whatever was taken from them mm -hmm. and again on the one side that's really beautiful when we find out that thing because we're like oh well this makes sense now i'm rooting for you even more than i was before because i understand what motivates you but i feel like there might be and we we won't know really until season four ultimately that there might be this kind of sub thesis of when you are free, when you free yourself of that thing that was propelling you through your backstory, then that's when you actually could maybe find your truest self, find perhaps something that resembles happiness or fulfillment, or even if it's momentary. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I feel like Flint, and this is where the fact that Flint and, and Anne have really interesting parallels. Okay, so they have the sexuality thing. That's an obvious parallel. They have, of course. you know, mm -hmm. if if we believe this idea of the whole, you know, ethos, pathos, logos thing, then in their threesomes, right. they are both the same. They are both mm -hmm. the pathos. So, and, and the mm -hmm. sexuality. So, like, they might be set aside because because what a part of their trauma has to do with something that that is so intrinsic, that it cannot be set aside. Right. And that that's so interesting too, because it, it's almost as if, you know, Anne is the, you know, <laughs> proto Flint. Like she, she is walking through the path that Flint did so long ago. But she's um, doing a better job of it. I think exactly. Yeah. And I think a part of that is, yeah. is oh. Max also saying, yep. Hey, at some point we, there is no happy ending for us here. Right. So why don't right. we just call this quits as friends and it won't be any uglier than it needs to be. And that has been probably the cleanest break of the entire show so far. Well, but also Anne, Anne has a mm. Jack and, mm. and James didn't have that. Yeah. That sure. Anne only has a, right. That, that Anne, I mean, it's just interesting. I mean, it's interesting, this kind of web of support that Anne has, like as much as she seems when when she was having her crisis, she seemed so all alone, and yet she still has her two other people. Like Flint, mm -hmm. if again, if we're going back to to these threesomes, Flint has lost his two other parts of his threesome, and is estranged from mm -hmm. Max currently. We don't know where that's going to go, right. <laughs> but her two other mm -hmm. parts of her threesome exist, and even when she loses one of them, she has the other. Yeah. So Flint is, you know, he has no tethers. He's without tether now. Well, and that, I mean, Flint is, Flint's time with civilization is over and Max wants so badly to be legitimized by it. Exactly. And I, again, I don't know if that's the yeah. right choice for Max. I'm curious how that's going to play yeah. out. I don't know if ultimately, mm. I mean, I do kind of believe that that's the thing that Max might need to let go of because that's the thing that stems from her idea of having something beyond yeah. choice that actually is a choice. Like she mm -hmm. defines it that way. The comparison she made to Anne and sexuality, like Anne is in a position where, where the thing is truly beyond choice, whereas Max def is defining it as such. Knowingly though, right? Right, but it is something that she could say, you know yeah. what, I'm actually mm -hmm. gonna choose to not, no longer feel the need to be inside that parlor. Well, and yeah, and I suppose that could be framed as, you know, her up until that point, that was her truth she was running from. Exactly. That, that feeling of, of not being good enough to be included. Right. Is something that actually she would, yeah. you know, her life was meant to counter that. Well, and look at, look at Vane. I mean, this, you know, there was that moment. I keep going back to this moment at the duel where, where Flint says, I don't care about the things that you think are important. The things that up until now have defined you, I don't care about that. Who are you? Mm -hmm. If Max had a moment like that where someone yeah. said to her, like, stop for a minute. Stop defining yourself by the thing you've always defined yeah. yourself by. What if you just asked yourself, mm -hmm. who are you? I, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, just you brought that up, Charles. I, I feel like his, his comments about uh, slavery or, mm -hmm. you know, enslaved people, uh, they stuck more they stuck out more to me the second time I heard them when, uh, <laughs> with the gift of uh, hindsight, 
Um, uh-huh. That you know, it, it, he he was clearly fighting that, and that's been tearing him apart. You know, on, on some level, seeing the you know how he was raised and and the the line about the unseen blow. Mm-hmm. You know that that oh, uh, yeah, man. Sure. One of the best lines to open up a season of a TV show. My goodness. Um, <laughs> You know, that mm. even now it is coming and we won't be ready for it when it gets here. Mm-hmm. And to not only turn out to be prophetic in that sense, but to get to the point where he says, it, it has come and I'm going to take that blow. Mm. Uh, that is, mm. I mean, mm-hmm. that is such a, because uh, he, he, he never does that. He never did that. You know, he was the yeah. one throwing them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that, right. that moment, yeah. I, I have to frame it that way to understand why, you know, uh, he took that step off of it. Because, mm-hmm. you know, him saying to Eleanor, mm-hmm. right, you know, I didn't see you coming, right? I didn't account for you that mm-hmm. I had said you were dead when mm-hmm. when Blackbeard first showed up. Um, but, you know, I'll get the upper mm-hmm. hand by, by taking this on myself and probably keeping alive the people you should actually be worried about. Mm. Yeah, he told Jack to go, and Jack turned out to be really, really important right away, which was nice. They didn't mm-hmm. make us wait for that one. That's um, true. Yeah. That's totally true. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I, I would love to talk about Billy a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Let's talk about. Oh, if we <laughs> must, Liz. Liz always happy to talk about Billy. <laughs> uh, because he's kind of the the perfect case in my mind of a person who entered into the story as morally and ethically good because mm-hmm. of what he was telling himself. And huh. Oh, that, that, interesting. You know, okay. that, that little speech where he said, we're all equal here, um, mm-hmm. you know, which, which is absolutely his, sure. his level or parents, uh, you know, saying that the no kings here, right. you know, this is kind of a, not, right. not even a meritocracy, really. It's, Everybody is just here and we're all together and everything is equal. And, yeah, you know, that's definitely what he was promoting dogs, in the dogs beginning. Dogs love cats and, and you know, uh, nothing bad happens here <laughs> if, to anyone who doesn't deserve it. And mm-hmm. at some point, because we're also given that insight that uh, he has kind of wrapped himself in that because he no longer sees himself fit, right, for his mm-hmm. parents. Right, right. Sure, he sure. He became a killer and that, you know, tainted him. Right. Um, Right, sure. But then over the course of the story, he he continues to say, you know, nobody's better than anyone else. Um, I'm just the same as everyone else. And we get that first mm-hmm. little note of when he takes over and starts instructing them during the careening, and we get the note that they've never done it this fast. Mm-hmm. Which is a, right. a very, yeah. like mm-hmm. a very logic, reason-based, you know, justification of leadership. Mm-hmm. That with the right person in charge, mm-hmm. we are all better. Mm-hmm. And I think that right. kind of ties back to, and it's where he ends up too, because his parents, their political stance was one thing, but he's standing there saying monarchy isn't necessarily bad if it's our king, right. you know, that he, he kind of took that first initial idea, which is so antithetical to, to what his parents, or at least the stance that he has at the beginning. In the span of one episode. Yeah. I mean, and then we get to the end of the season and he is uh, sending death warnings and then obviously ordering people to go murder somebody. Um, mm-hmm. But by that point, I mean, you're stepping into the <laughs> the civilized world of the least awful outcome, right? Um, that's right. No, that no, civilization that's kind right. of erases the moral absolutes, uh, you, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I, I like that there is that kind of reflection that as – as Jack was learning that leadership is just a mess mm-hmm. and dealing with people who are yeah. inherently lesser than others makes yep. it bad for everybody. Yes. And then, uh-huh. you know, over the course of it, when they're in that room saying that we, when they were becalmed that some of our men can't eat because they mm-hmm. are not as important mm-hmm. to all of our survival, Billy doesn't say a word. Yeah, no, it's essential. Silver that's fighting um, that. That's true. Exactly. Yeah. It, Billy is at that point already, you know, has come to see that, even if he's not saying it. Um, That's interesting. That, so is this, do you feel like this is the process for Billy of becoming a leader? Like this is the price of becoming a leader? I think, yeah. And, I, and you know what, when, when Flint, uh, you know, cut the to and 
those men died. Right. Uh, the Billy of the first yeah. season might have been outraged, but this one just watched. Right. Because I think even then he knew, yeah. you know, he recognized that in Flint that there was a time where I would have seen this differently. Oh, shit. So we've um, really been going through right. this process more than I even really necessarily noticed. Well, and, it was, and it was two separate realizations, mm, I think, for me, which right. was Billy realizing that by the end of the season, leadership is, uh, you know, a net good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not only that, but a sure. monarchy can work if the monarch is, <laughs> you know, it's out benevolent. for the betterment of everyone, right? right? The benevolent tyrant, <laughs> you know? They're not a tyrant if they're doing all the right things. Right. This is like what John brought up last week about talking about how we all were rooting for Maddie when when she, as someone who is essentially (laughs) a benevolent, benevolent and beautiful tyrant, is is trying to school an elected official, Silver, Mm -hmm. in how to lead his men. mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that that is a reflection of like everything that has come because of that is because silver stopped denying what he was actually capable of, right? That he wasn't, right. he was the Absolutely. one not strong enough to stick. Yeah. Um, and, and Billy, you know, the other realization he had is don't you go, I'm better at this. You know, right. like he said to Flint on the beach, this is my thing. This is the thing that I know better than anyone else here. Um, and, you know, by the end of it, he has just taken that on completely. He's a kingmaker. Uh, but <laughs> but the men, and even if the men are kind of, you know, referred to as kind of a whole, um, the fact of the matter is Flint right. claims to be that but is inherently not honest about the kind of person he actually is. Uh, if he had accepted mm-hmm. that he was a villain – he, he probably could have been more effective. I mean, Blackbeard yeah, is incredibly absolutely, effective. absolutely right. Um, and and I think you yeah. have to at some mm-hmm. point say that Silver is coming up as just being who he actually was always meant to be, and Flint is performing. And at some point, mm-hmm. the men have realized that Silver doesn't claim to know it. Like we see him working it out, which means he is uh, examining how the situation is developing. He's not claiming to be the one pushing it the way it's going, um, which is honestly, mm-hmm. if his art continues, it is just every single story about a good man's rise to king ever. Right. You know, the, the only person fit to rule is the person who never wanted to. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> right. right? That, you know, that doesn't describe anyone better than it does silver because he has no interest in anyone here. Yeah. He doesn't care about anything. Right. Um, he is only care about the men started on a human level. You know, they liked him. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, because huh. he wanted mm. them to. It's it's not a... And I mean, if we go back to the whole song, yeah. the little thing, then, my God, that's just a glimpse into his childhood uh, defining his adulthood. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, I, that is just such mm. an attractive thing to be because the conversation, and you, you kind of spoke about it, uh, the conversation over the fire... Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah. I didn't read any malice into that on Silver's <laughs> point. Um, All right, you're with because, Luke, you're in Luke's you're mm-hmm. in Luke's camp. There. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely see that there. I just, you know, I think he he said, you know, no one in this world is closer to you than I am. And I think that in kind of the same way that Max saw where things were going mm-hmm. and said. For your sake, I think we mm-hmm. should part ways. Mm-hmm. Silver knows that Flint can't ever do that. And so the idea right. that, mm-hmm. you know what, I'm not going to be the one that ends you in the sense that I'm going to be the one who does it. But when it comes down to that, I think I'm the one that makes it out of this. Mm-hmm. Because, I, you know, mm-hmm. even if it – at this point, it would be the men who did anything, you know, I think more than more than Silver. I mean, he says, you know, they have fewer resources. They're more vulnerable. Like – Silver's invulnerability is the many, and Flint at this point is really the few. <laughs> right. Which, right. Um, yeah. And, I, and honestly, I think that when, you know, they come back to NASA, Billy, having realized what leadership is and knows that Silver's motivations are actually just for these guys to be okay. Right. Um, Which was once Billy's motivation was just to protect yeah, his crew. And- 
and to protect all of them equally. Mm-hmm. And that is a, mm-hmm. I think, you know, yes. if, if Silver and Billy, maybe more specifically, is on his way to becoming a great man, then that saying kind of dictates at some point he's going mm-hmm. to have to do some bad things. Yeah, right. But you're all That's- good people. But you're all good people. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, see, but that's that's the thing, right? Is is Billy has those biceps, but then when he sat down and said that Dufresne realized his feelings toward you had become an obstacle in remaining mm-hmm. a part of this crew, I know Liz and I were both fanning mm-hmm. ourselves, like, oh, you know, Billy is speaking intelligently. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Yes, that is, so right, exciting. Yeah, that's another part of it. I is, was so proud. I, I feel like from the very start, Billy was always that smart. Oh, that's that's yes. great. Right? And he, he wouldn't speak up because he probably thought it's not my place to. Right, right. No, that's a much better right. story yeah. than, than not understanding why he went from not so smart to totally smart. <laughs> yeah, well, and I mean, you, you kind of hit that nail on the head when they were in that meeting, you know, they were in the room together and he just flat out put his foot down and said, I think I have a better idea. Mm -hmm. Um, No. And that was, he seemed very uh uncomfortable with that in the beginning. He got more comfortable with it very quickly, but in the beginning he was very uncomfortable. (laughs) Yeah. I I do. I don't want to let him off the hook though for sending those men to kill Throckmorton or was that his name, right? Throckmorton. Yes. Yeah. It took me a while to get, be able uh to say that name. Yeah, uh, we definitely leave that on a note of him saying, you know, oh, uh, we haven't even introduced our villain yet. Um, yeah. You're going to think it's me <laughs> because I'm going to send you to murder this guy. But right. uh, yeah, it really isn't because someone oh. else is better at this than I am. So wait, so wait, wait. Are we saying that the person who writes the story is actually the villain? Because I would really enjoy us all officially saying that because, sorry, that's just me messing with the writers. <laughs> <laughs> I love Billy so much. Yeah. And he, I have, gosh, my respect for him just goes up with every episode. And now I know in season four, there's no way that's going to hold because I know where we find him in Treasure Island. I know. So he's, he'll rise a little higher and then begin his descent. I imagine, although I, I mean, I could be wrong. They, they, they could be. That crown is heavy. That's true. That's true. But maybe we'll just see no, it see, beginning no, no, no. to but, wear but down what on him at the end. Totally just, holds is, is, Billy might crack if he had the crown on him, but he's putting it on a made-up person, really. Right. He's being crown uh, adjacent. He's, he's not. He's not wearing <laughs> the crown. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> crown yeah, adjacent. Yeah, silver's the head, but he's the neck. Lovely. Right? He can turn the head any way he wants. <laughs> he does have a real. He does have a very strong neck. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Very smart. Yes. Yeah, and you know what? You had <laughs> very strong. Everything. <laughs> he really does. Um, you mentioned it. <laughs> At the time that um, I think it was your your favorite thing was Charles is shaking his head. That was Liz's, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yes, um, but Billy knew it before he did. Yeah, it's totally true. That, I know that is kind it's of true. God, I, I love that scene. It's, yeah, I love that yeah, scene and, so much. Yeah, I just and he's you know uh, almost in tears uh, in realizing it, mm-hmm. but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like if, if you're watching that for the first time, you might have the thought, why isn't Billy saving him? Right. And that, that is... Billy uh, totally gets right. it. Yeah, yeah. He understood before... Yeah. I, yeah, the shake of the head was for us, I think, and for the men with Billy. Yeah. Right, because but before that, it, before know, that, but... they're like, what, Billy, what are we doing? What are we doing? And he's like, wait, wait a minute. Like, he keeps, you know, he understood already what was going yeah. on there. Story, story wise. I mean, the two of them were basically right, building a story together. Right. Uh huh. And I think that gives a lot of a lot of credit yeah. to just like how <laughs> how cemented uh, Zach McGowan's performance of Charles was. That I would buy that. Like, I know, it, right? Yeah. If, if he had, because uh, you know, at that point, he is so not the person he once was. Um, yeah, right. That, uh, he arced so beautifully. You know, it's kind of like the the Han Solo should have died thing. Um, <laughs> that he he recognizes. You know yeah. what? Right. I think objectively, I have the least to lose. Right. 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 Uh, and that is. Oh, yeah, and and you know what? A, uh-huh. a big part of that might have been at some point that this is moving above my head. You know, like this is moving into mm-hmm. the realm of 
power brokers. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. not my thing. Right. Um, uh. You know, I, I wanted a future for this place, but that future is civilization at this point, and I'm not really built for that. Right. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. so painful. Heartbreaking. It is so heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. And that, uh, yeah, and, and him in the light in that jail cell and her in the dark. Yeah. So, so where, where were you with yes. Charles from the beginning? Like oh. for me, I feel like almost the fact that I didn't love him from the beginning makes my rewatches and my later feelings about him in a way even stronger. Um, Liz, Liz might, Liz might argue with me that with about that oh, because Liz loved him from yeah. the beginning, but I feel that way for <laughs> myself that like all of these realizations of the subtlety and the beauty of Charles Vane are almost stronger for me because I didn't love him from the beginning. Hmm. Where, where were you with Charles mm -hmm. from the beginning? Uh, if you haven't noticed yet, I have a tendency to remember things. Um, yeah, seriously, I love it. Oh my God. <laughs> I feel, to be honest, wait, can I just pause for one second? Andrew? Don't yeah. say. I'm so much less embarrassed by my own ability to quote <laughs> random lines from the show because you can do it too. I'm feeling much better about myself right now. Okay. I, I'm so happy that I'm, I'm, that's a gift. I'm so glad to be giving. Uh, <laughs> but when that, um, you know, so, so when, when uh, Charles kind of came into it, I think it's fun to look back on now and see that he was the first person to show that uh, having your name established is something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. Because when he mm -hmm. says his name is Charles Vane, like yes, there is yes. some pride behind mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Oh, of the yeah. ranger. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And that is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, why wouldn't Jack want it when it's delivered so cool? Um, That's so true. But, oh, to stand but, in Charles Vane's, sure, like to want yeah. your name to be among the great pirates and to stand in mm -hmm. Charles Vane's shadow. Oh, poor Jack. He, yes. Yeah. I mean, he made, mm -hmm. yeah, made, made a career out of it, as, yep, as was he said. Did. Um, he did. And, and kind of, you know what, when, mm -hmm. when he knew that, that I think he, he only knew Charles's life was on the line at, at that point, he may be hanged that, um, yeah. he said, you know, uh, like I will do the same, you know, again, almost mm -hmm. like I'll follow him there too. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, I, the, the, I, I always remember that line from Braveheart, uh, uh, among the, the Bruce's where he says, you know, you, you admire William Wallace because, uh, you know, he's brave, but so is a dog. Hmm. Uh, you know, that back to dogs. It, is, it, it is, always, it yeah. always comes back to dogs. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that crossed my mind as I was listening to you talk about that. The, the singular person who values loyalty, uh, even if they are a blunt instrument, mm -hmm. um, is, I don't know if I, if I cared about him, but I liked him as, uh, a factor because those characters are easy to like, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. every, everyone likes the character who just has a simple idea of right and wrong. Yeah. See, I think uh, I don't, I don't like that character. That's so interesting. I'm so <laughs> um, fascinated by this. Oh, well, like you don't like who he started out as? Uh -huh. No, I mean, it just, mm. it just didn't speak to me at all. This is part of a whole different conversation about types of heroes. Yes. Liz. Andrew's also a cat man. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> well, of course he is. He's not an idiot. <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah, I, I understand all the points on uh, because again, like there was a way that it could have gone that, that Charles would just remain, you know, one of those bad Saturday morning. Uh, scary guys. Um, no, I don't think sure. I was ever afraid of that. It's just, I mean, just on a visceral level, he was the guy who was opposed to Flint and Flint was my guy. And so I think it really came down to that in large part. And, and the blunt, oh, it's funny. I sure, only started yeah. to love Charles when I realized he wasn't the blunt instrument. Like when I started, mm -hmm. I, I think I was blinded yes, for a for variety sure. of reasons in the beginning to the subtleties of his, of the characterization and of the character in my first watch and yeah only later on did i start to understand like now i could watch zach mcgowan do the most subtle things with his face it's a very different type yeah, of sure. subtle performance than what toby stevens does um the mm. way that Vane expresses himself yeah. in subtle ways is so different than the way that flint <laughs> expresses himself in subtle ways and yet both of them are equally delightful to me at this point i've i've reached a point where both of them i watch so closely because i feel like there's so much to watch yeah <laughs> i i would love reading that script you know uh 
Eleanor slams the gate in Charles' face. Oh, Charles God. gives a steely gaze. Oh, my you know? God. That scene. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. But sure. the steely gaze that he gives is just like, I because just it's still. Like just for that scene, right? That moment. No, it's just like I could watch Zach McGowan yeah. be oh. scary and vulnerable at the same time forever. I just, I'm just. Mm-hmm. I think that's why I liked him right from the beginning. I think he came yeah, out. He you came understood out with it from the beginning. Right I did from the not, beginning. I yeah. Hmm. Oh, you get bonus points for that. Yeah. Seriously, I think anyone who loves Vane from the beginning gets bonus points in my eyes because I really feel like that's a a bit of a deficit on my part <laughs> that I didn't get him in the beginning. Sure, I'll take it. But him. I was with you, Daphne, because I'm sure when, when we were when they were in that room and he said, are you surprised as I am? I'm the only one behaving myself. I was thinking, you got dragged here. You didn't even want to be here. Yeah. And you just sat there not saying anything. You don't brag about it being anything more than it is. <laughs> Although I did I did recognize that the whole like coin <laughs> finger thing was pretty badass. But you the know. coin thing that's... was pretty badass. <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah. He just has swagger. He does have swagger. Mm -hmm. I just, I've never been a lover of swagger. It's the fact that he has Mm -hmm. swagger with so much depth that that's what made me fall in love with him. Right. Because swagger. Yeah, swagger alone is only fun for about five minutes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's really only, you know, you can be tough. You can say, you know, I'm Charles Vane from the of the Ranger for, you know, and there's like, yeah, sure. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of cool. Right. But ultimately, there has to be a lot more going on there for me to be excited about it. And and he's got it. Yeah, but we saw his white underbelly just immediately. Yeah. When he I had know. that interaction with Eleanor. Oh, in gosh. Room. Oh, it didn't read to me the it first didn't time do anything because for I just you? wasn't. I think I wasn't just wasn't ready for him to be that person. So it just. On my no. first watch, on my second oh, watch, it sure. was all there for me. It was all laid out for me. He's like a just a schoolboy, right? Asking for a, oh, for an extension on his I assignment. Know. Yeah, oh, it's so hard to watch it now. He's just so in love. Yeah, so you know what? I think a big part of it was in those first episodes, the the hierarchy of characters and like power players is based on smarts. Is is based mm-hmm. on how intelligent these people are. Yes. Like Jack has swagger, but he's so clearly intelligent right. that, uh, you know, we kind of think right. that, Oh, sure. he is going places. And Charles never comes off as, uh, intelligent, but right. no. And that's, and I think we yeah, kind of got to a good place way. where sure. it was, you know, there's still pirates. Like you don't need to have a master's degree to be effective here or to be, Right. of value or uh or heroic right and i i think that was a a, mm-hmm. a nice reveal because eventually it came down to the fact that um what he said in the cell with pastor lambrick was mm-hmm. like more honest than philosophical mm-hmm. absolutely and i think that that, that is a you, sure. you could yeah just sure. switch that scene around to the point that it is just a criminal talking to uh you know the the pastor before they're hanged and mm-hmm. it, it it makes sure. sense because his values were in the right place mm-hmm. and that i think was a, was an important mm-hmm. thing and it's probably he may be the only character <laughs> left who is um featherstone might be the closest <laughs> of someone who is you know here because they've made the right decisions and have been adaptable, not necessarily because they had the ability to analyze right. things and right. act accordingly. Right, right. No, right. Right. Featherstone <laughs> is very reactive, but he's very good at that. <laughs> exactly. He's a good go-between. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Charles, I I just watched those finales again, so seeing him in that gibbet is my memory, <sighs> and it's just so... Yeah. That kind of encapsulates um... the you know, uh, descent of that character is he was never more alive, but that was, I, yeah, I, I just, I think that is such a great, yeah. I hate to see it happen. And I, I didn't think it would, but I, I take my hat off to the writers that really that's a character who is out for yeah. himself and would survive just like a dog. But, um, man, he couldn't have chosen to go out more nobly. Mm-hmm. Like he's, well, and, and it was martyr. a process. We watch, we watched him go down that yes. road. We watched him have a process of becoming an awakening really yeah oh charles 
Show me my future. Oh. Yeah, here in this room. And then to, yeah, uh, yeah it was an incredible yeah. arc. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Really masterfully done. And that uh, just terrifies me for where everyone else is going. Because if that's what a masterful arc looks like in the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know, I know. And they can do so yeah, think, much in one season. Yeah. Oh, gosh. They can do so much the, in one yeah. episode. And honestly, hats yeah. off to everyone involved in this for teaching us the really important lesson that if you stick to short-term goals, you're okay. Because as soon as you go to long-term ones, you'll probably be killed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or at least, you know, begin on your path to destruction. Right. This is the lesson we need to learn. Yeah, exactly. Or don't be a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm still holding on to my idea that there's a basic optimism in this show. We'll see. We'll see. I feel I have a feeling that there's a good chance that season four will beat that out of me, but <laughs> <laughs> I no, you know, I think Woods, Woods Rogers saying, you know, you people who think that you can change the reality around you because you would prefer it to be that way. I mean, like he he's he, he's giving them the stance of the people who change the world. He is. But the truth is, we know we know who wins this story. So, well, we know who wins the story. But I mean, you know, hmm, where history is written by the victors and yeah. Uh, that's we, true. we already know that this is going to be the yeah, actual the historical account that, uh, you know, I, I think really it sums up for me in that moment after Charles is hanged is that should have been a moment of victory and it was anything but. Mm-hmm. So history will say that yeah. justice was done, yeah, but yeah, everybody who was there. Right. You know. Although I um, have to say that the portrayal right. felt very... Um, it was very mixed. I mean, you do come out feeling the energy of that group of people shifting. I mean, I feel like the end of season three is a, is one of, of uh, hope for the pirates. I mean, I, again, hope that we'll soon be dashed, but, but that, but that, that as sad as that right. bit of the story is for Charles, that is actually a moment where they all have an awakening and that's a pretty exhilarating. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a powerful scene because you're so devastated by, by the loss of Charles Vane. And yet in that moment, right before the season finale, that the season finale is truly one of triumph. I mean, the silver Flint thing, very ambiguous and terrifying for me, but, but that overall, that is a moment of triumph. Sure. The thing that introduced that, the thing that brought us into this wave of possible triumph is the hanging of Charles Vane and the fact that the crowd turns and that the crowd becomes suddenly aligned with him instead of against him. History will, as we said, we, we can't all take a trip down <laughs> to the, the Pirate Republic tomorrow. Um, no, as, mu- as but, much as I would like to. Right. Not an right. option. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, as, as in the immortal words of Iron Man 2. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. You really tell, only, tell us. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you, you really only need to get blood in the water. You know, you don't need to kill to show that it can be killed. And we're not that far away from the American Revolution. Right. No, so, absolutely not. And I, I think that that is um, – it's. I mean, this is part of the reason why my history buff is is no mm-hmm. story it takes place in a vacuum, right? That um, the only interaction right, course, we're, we're given with the colonies, you know, is uh, Charlestown, which right. is – monstrous but monstrous in a way that isn't necessarily on a personal level like right. it's it's a civilization level and we're kind sure. of being walked through these people who are good people who society says are bad that are just wanting to be themselves mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's true i don't know mm-hmm. i'm not american but i can say that that sentiment <laughs> is kind of as american as it gets yeah it is um, absolutely well I mean, from what I understand, and this is interesting, I actually, I think I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, our friend and friend of the show, Alistair Stevens, in the context of his podcast about Outlander, yeah. he talked about the history of Jacobites and tied that into the American Revolution. Now, Jacobites are also very tied to our mm. pirates. In the show Black Sails, Hornigold is a Jacobite. I don't know if Hornigold was 
in history teach was a Jacobite. And so a lot of those people had to run away. Mm. And so it makes complete sense that a portion of them would become pirates. Now, Alistair lays out very beautifully that many of the revolutionaries in the U.S., or what became the U.S., in the colonies that became the U.S., were also former Jacobites. And that he lays out how the Jacobites learn from their own experience, especially in the 45, how to basically wage a different sort of war against Britain. And in addition to that, in the tiny bit of readings, I mean, again, so many of our listeners are so much more knowledgeable about the actual history of pirates than I am. But from what I understand, <laughs> the, there was an aspect of the Republic of Pi, the actual Republic of Pirates in Nassau was a bit of an inspiration to people with a revolutionary spirit in the colonies in the continental U.S. Sure, I can see that. Um, so this is wow. all very interesting in terms of the actual history, which I'm not very good at, like the bit that I've gleaned now from friends and mm-hmm. a bit of reading, basically. There is an actual interesting tie mm-hmm. historically with all of this stuff. So again, I will put Alistair's lecture um, in the show notes uh, so that everyone can listen to that because it is really interesting about the history of Jacobites. But, but again... This is, yeah. I, maybe this is where you were going, Andrew. Maybe I just took this and ran with it in a totally different direction. But, <laughs> but there is an aspect of this story that I think um, is interesting in, in what became an actual rebellion against, you know, England slash civilization to begin with. Again, not to say that the colonies weren't also part of civilization. I'm not trying to say that they were pirates and that they were really, sure. really, you know, rethinking all of the norms and shame and gossip and all of that stuff. But but there is a there is something to that, to this like to this being some level that perhaps like many revolutions, the 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 people who are truly on the fringe start it and then and then the other people end up adopting it. Yeah the well as yeah Flint said, right? I mean if if you just do it, and maybe that this is part of what he was thinking that his revenge would extend beyond his life when when he mm-hmm. said to the queen, you know, if we just do it, mm. other people will hear about it, and maybe you bring the whole thing down. Mm. Yeah, if the ending is 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 Flint gets the credit for having that thought and being ruthless and you know nothing to lose, crazy enough to get the ball rolling, then. Uh, Mm-hmm. He he's failing loud enough, uh, right. <laughs> even if he doesn't win. <laughs> that's not a bad. Yeah. That's not a bad way for this story to go. I just thought of the power of Flint wielding social media <laughs> in this day and age. Oh goodness! <laughs> oh, hashtag adult feelings, of course. <laughs> of course. That would that would be his first sweep. Just just met with Lord Hamilton about the NASA plan. Hashtag adult feelings. <laughs> it's very inspiring to listen to the words of someone who can throw it all away in the name of revolution. Yeah. And then someone who knows because what does he say to her? He says the, the odds will never be better. Um right. and I think Absolutely. that you know, after the fact, he wasn't talking about winning. You know, maybe maybe we'll never be more able to throw a hard enough punch, right? Sure, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So what? So what do you think? I mean, I, I guess we talked about this a little bit earlier. D- do we think that Flint sees himself coming out of this? Like, do we really think that Flint, like Flint in that Flint in that cage, was clearly suicidal? I mean, he was he was ready to give up. He was he was vocally mm-hmm. ready to give up, and then Silver convinced him out of that, and he thanked. And then he gave that speech and he thanked Silver for opening that door. I mean, aside from his mic- his micromanaging tendencies, which I think is kind of like the thing where he doesn't want to imagine himself not being in charge of everything. Mm-hmm. But do, sure. do we think that, that Flint is actively saying, I will sacrifice myself for, I mean, do you think that some part of him is thinking, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for this cause? I'm so curious. Does he, is he that committed? I mean, he's that committed, obviously. He's, he's as committed as anyone could ever yeah. be to revenge. Do you think that he envisions that? Or do you think that's just, he's so determined that that's what will happen? Or do we think that yeah. that's something that he's actively has in the back of his mind that like, I will, I will crash and burn for the sake of this? Yeah. 
and well, I don't, I don't even is know he capable now? of imagining himself crashing and burning? Now it was like he went from suicidal yes. to possibly thinking himself invincible. It's like like what Teach said sure. when Teach said, you know, either you're overdue or. Or you're, what did he say? Didn't say immortal, but he's like, either, either you're, you're unkillable or you're way overdue. Oh, uh uh-huh. Does, maybe Flint thinks himself, you know, now invincible. I don't know. I'm just so curious what. Well, he does have that line that he says to Silver, right? You know, a lot of other people have tried. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And having him out on top of this. But, you know, but that could be pirate theater. I mean, that could have been bravado. It's so hard to know sure. in, in that conversation. There were, I feel like that conversation had moments of each of them speaking from the heart and moments of each of them mm-hmm. doing theater. Uh, I feel like on Flint's side, that part ended up being mostly theater. I think that, I think that he was honestly super surprised. I mean, he's surprised by all of it. He was surprised by Dobbs, right. by the choice of Dobbs surprised i think also by how ballsy silver had gotten to be um i think that you know that conversation in overall i think when flint opened up and told silver what he told him about thomas he came into that conversation with one idea of what the power balance between the two of them was and he and then he was little by little introduced to how wrong he was about the level of power silver had and then by the end of the conversation i think i think flint was spooked i mean i think he's spooked and he's flint so he's spooked and he'll be fine with Uh it ultimately you know and when you see them across that water like flint doesn't look scared i'm scared but when flint looks across the water at silver and maddie i don't think i don't think fear is what he's experiencing i think that's definitely again put me in a scary place but (laughs) but (laughs) but i think that that part of the conversation for flint was if not all at least partly bravado i'm curious i feel like we've gotten a lot of peeks into what silver thinks is the extent of flint's power i don't feel like i have a sense right now of what flint sees as his own power and capability and limits if he sees limits in himself maybe he doesn't Maybe he can't be bothered. I mean, maybe he's just so determined that he doesn't even think in those terms. I think he wants, like, if everyone's going to die, he wants to be the last so he can see them go first. Right. I feel like the the ore to shovel concept is so long gone for him. I mean, what's waiting for him? What, What life? He has no Miranda. What settled life waits for him now? I think he is ready for death. I don't think that he is going to necessarily throw himself on the Mm -hmm. pyre or go out in the way that Vane did or even that it's necessarily that he's willing to sacrifice and give himself up to the for the cause Mm -hmm. so much as he's just tired now he's gonna fight with till his last breath but he's expecting that last breath to come sooner rather than later and probably hoping for it just a bit hoping that he'll go out fighting well and I think hoping that that's the culmination Right, the the idea of Silver carrying this on without him there to steer it is mm-hmm. is I think what it, it, I mean. It was what Silver was saying to him around that fire, and that's what so bothered yeah. him was I don't want this to be bigger than me because I started this. Right, um, this is my yes, thing. This sure. is supposed to be my fight. Yeah, this right. is as much as I say it's about against England. You know, that I'm the right. person who stood up against it and. For all the things I am, a martyr is the thing I have not yet elevated to. That was Charles, but Flint is is not there. Well, and Mm -hmm. again, I mean, I think in the time that we've seen Flint, right? Like, so there's Flint Tolstoy, and I'm not going to talk. In the time that we've seen him in, in 1715, not his backstory. I mean, the thing that always ends up resonating is when Miranda said to him, I think you're fighting for the sake of fighting. I mean, I think... I think he had a moment. He had a moment where he was willing, you know, when when they found Abigail and he thought that maybe he could make a deal with Peter Ash. I think he let go of that for a minute. And, you know, Mm. and we know how that turned out for him. So I feel like, you know, most of the time that we've known Flint, he's been existing in that reality of fighting for the sake of fighting. And I think if, you know, it's gotten only stronger, if anything, because again, he has no tethers. He's gone deep into the darkness. He, he -hmm. lost his last tether. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, this is, I mean, I, our listeners are so sweet and so sometimes 
bizarrely optimistic um, and want to like <laughs> come up with some, you know, some scenario where Flint has something that resembles a happy ending. And I just, I don't see it. I mean, I don't, I love him. No, I mean, I, I find him one of the most engaging characters I've ever seen ever. Sure. Sure. Mm hmm. There's nothing waiting for him. I mean, without Miranda, there was Miranda. So that was like, right. you know, when he, when they were at Peter Ash's house and he told the story about how he picked the name Flint and how he was willing to let mm -hmm. him go. There was, we had a moment where, where there was a vision of a world where James could find, could be James McGraw again and live a different life. Mm -hmm. And that's gone. I mean, you know, we said goodbye to that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. mm. And that, yeah, I, I also feel that if, if, you know, Woods Rogers came to him and said, we'll give you everything you want um, if you hang and not another drop of British blood mm -hmm. uh, is spilled. I don't know that Flint would take him up on it because that's no. not why he's doing this. No, that's not and why that's he's so doing sad. it. Yeah. Um, right. I don't but mean, don't... you know, for the story, it's for him. That's, that's sad right. that no, he no, is. No, no, it's totally right. sad. Sure. And I don't think, I mean, as much as he thought that was his purpose in the beginning, you know, in season one and part of season two, as much as, you know, he claimed for that to be, he was acting, he was actively acting in the direction of trying to create this world where he could walk away and again, take right. that, take that right. oar until someone sees it as a shovel. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was ever what he was trying to do. I really don't. Again, I think there was a moment where he was convinced that maybe that could actually happen in a way that he could live with and make Miranda happy. But I don't think that was ever his goal. That was just a story he was telling himself. I know. I know. I know he's the most tragic of tragic figures ever. <laughs> like, you know, if only he could have lived to be 300. You know, he probably would have gotten to the point where he thought, okay, I can rest now. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But hey, yeah. you know, the people who change things rarely get happy endings. That's true. Um, um, nor have happy lives. I mean, that's totally true. So perhaps on this tragic note, we should end our conversation. <laughs> what did we decide it was? <laughs> Abigail's note. Oh, oh, yes. We could do Abigail's <laughs> note over and over again. And then we can do Bane's <laughs> note a few times. Oh. <laughs> right. Oh. Andrew. It has been such a huge pleasure having you on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, the pleasure was all. It was great to hear a new oh, voice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm. This is a, a dream come true for myself, and I get. I mean, I really, you know, it's it's an opportunity to just go on record as saying that um, all of the work that was put into making this by people who put it in just because they didn't know another way to do it. Mm -hmm. That is just. Uh, I have the most respect for that and I have the most appreciation for that possible. And um, uh, thank you for ensuring that with this podcast, I appreciated every bit of it uh, at the ripe old age of, of three decades, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to find a show that is uh, an instant favorite yes. and mm -hmm. one that I did not expect to find. I, I can't thank the people who made it enough for that. Right. Yeah. Agreed. So I'll have that be my final word. Thank you so much for, for having me and letting me talk nonsensically about this show that I just have to gush over. It was so much fun. Loved it. Yes. So much there to chew on. It was really fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Never thank the cabin boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, yeah. I meant get yeah, me my run. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so next week, I know Andrew joked about this, but next week we actually will have Toby Schmitz on with us. What? What? Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again for listening and for joining us this week. Until next time from Common Room Radio, I'm Liz Stevens. I'm Daphne Olive. And I'm Andrew Dice. Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. 
Join the conversation by using the hashtag FathomsDeep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.